and roll into the next one, which is, um, as we now have in physics, this discussion was this all, as it, and it's been plaguing um, people since um, the pre-Socratics, um, um, this idea, was this real at all? Certainly uh, Baudrillard in uh, uh, the procession of the simulacrum, um, simula simulation and simulacrum, this discussion of what, was this all real anyway? Um, uh, but what we do know what is real and finite, as I made you watch that film, The Future of Work and Death, is um, cessation. We don't know when it ceases, um, uh, only the dead know when it, ce it ceases, but we have seen examples of that and that demands empathy. Last lecture was on cops, students, doctors. I am in the research position of studying, working on, inventing simulated spaces. I have a deep love. I'm in Stoller Center, the arts um, complex over at uh, in Stony Brook. I love um, the aspects of breaking down silos and finding common <coughs> commonalities. And we now have a lot of people who want to defy commonalities. Um, but it's fun anyway. One of the deepest, most common uh, realms I found was this question of, of maximizing something, satisfying, deciding, employing agency, and living with it, which is also part of agency. Um, this leads me to uh, moral spaces, immoral spaces, and amoral spaces. Um, this is perfect right here. Here's a training for the Casper moral, morals test in the med school um, uh, uh, lineup. Um, preventative, curative, palliative. Uh, preventive is don't smoke. Um, curative is you got stage four cancer. We, we better go into high gear with what we know. Um, yes, yes, doctor, will. Palliative is, um, we're all going to die, but you're going to die sooner than others because, unfortunately, we did not get around to the cancer in time or whatever. You got hit by a bus or whatever. Um, um, the pa No, the bus is not a good example. Palliative implies time and uh, knowing that um, the specific numbers of your death as opposed to not knowing when you're going to die. Um, this is the doctor. But what about um, you? Uh, Joe Q. Public, um, the student, the, the person who's beyond zombie status, who wants to, and the, again, the Joseph Campbell quote, um, it's not so much we're out there looking for meaning, but looking for situations in which we feel fully alive. Whether the Greek audience watching Oedipus Rex felt fully alive, understanding, seeing Oedipus Rex and the tragedy of, of the great man stumbling and falling, creating fear and pity within his audience and saying, yes, um, I will go fight Sparta on Friday um, after what I saw here. Um, you've convinced me. Um, Elizabeth in England, um, seeing Hamlet, which we talked about before, and saying, yes, um, legitimacy is in balance with a feudal legitimacy of a prince. Royalty is in balance with this new individual, the new person who is... Uh, the conqueror of a world if they have enough gumption to go out and get it. Sir Francis Drake and his pirates, privateers becoming colonials um, is strange. Um, maybe there's not such a far stretch between being pirates and privateers. One could say the Spanish conquistadors were a bunch of, of ruffian pirates who um, attempted exploiting, plundering cultures rather than robbing ships on their way. 
Certainly the English were in the business of robbing Spanish ships and so forth on the way, um, but then realized as a tiny island nation that they better get their act together maybe after seeing Hamlet and saying, well, it's our destiny agency. Brecht, coming out of Weimar, Germany, seeing uh, the devastating effects of World War I on economics and thus the spirit. Uh, as a leftist Marxist, he was into materialist determinism, saying it's all economics, it's... It's what we're sat with. And uh, living in this very precarious, like the two times, Periclean Greece, Elizabethan England, and Weimar Germany, all immensely precarious. Um, uh, and we kind of know what happened in all three of those. Um, uh, Weimar Germany was a time of great liberality, uh, existentially defying the the so-called Great War and its carnage on the ground with boots on the ground. Thus, they developed a kind of one-upping, trumping sort of aspect toward warfare. Let's make airplanes. Let's make... So we can bomb the ground. Uh, all of these things to get around uh, strategic deadlock. Um, Brecht saw the strategic deadlock between the communists and the um, capitalists after World War I in Germany, which Germany with America was poised on the <coughs> level of, with the U.S. of inheriting the world economically. Um, but of course, America won um, at that time. Um, and this led to... Uh, uh, the overinflated markets, uh, hyperinflation. I think he wrote Caucasian Chalk Circle in the 30s after the crash of Wall Street. So all these economic events led up. If a person sitting in the Weimar audience looking at a Breck piece, um, they would have the same capacity for reflection that um, uh, the Greeks the Elizabethans have, like, what am I seeing here? What are you tr implying I do? What am I inferring? Uh, what should I do? I got to take this wheelbarrow of money and go get a loaf of bread. Um, what is the best system to deal with this? And, of course, in Germany of the 20s led to the, the fascism of the 30s through a kind of an interesting twist of fate which looked like um, these fascist inclinations were going away by 28. And of course, the crash happened in 29 and put Mr. a little corporal Austrian misfit um, uh, art school failure, uh, Adolf Hitler, firmly in the driver's seat. Um, which again led to... Um, the United States coming out the victor, but put it in a Cold War. All of these things we could reflect on. How do you reflect on? We've got pol police, doctors, young people, students. It's kind of an amoral thing like breathing. It's like, oh, you you got to continue your studies. you got to become a student because the, the new masters is the old bachelors. And you go, yes, 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 of course, of course. Uh, and then you do maybe the thing that's pointed out by society as the right thing to do is extend your loans to um, work to get an advanced degree um, and that leads to um, debt uh, which is one could say uh, in the preventive sense if we're looking at this in terms of health not a good thing for your future self uh, keeping your debt down uh, not drinking the Kool-Aid, um, and so forth. But what do we do? Um, this is a very simple thing. And again, I'm, I'm pointing out a fact of um, my fascination for the amoral. Um, my research currently is VR and AR spaces, how to involve them uh, with social uh, VR. 
social forms of, of greater immersion to hopefully increase greater empathy, but often it doesn't lead, it leads to greater forms of geekdom and um, nerding out and, and becoming uh, lacking in agency. I contend that games are pretty much amoral spaces. Like you can, you can blow away uh, bad guys and prostitutes in Grand Theft Auto and there's no repercussion. Does that lead you to work out aspects, as Baudrillard pointed out, the simulacrum in real space? Um, could. There, there have been various uh, studies done with this um, that say that games and gaming are not a completely amoral space. But my job is um, is simulated space are simulated spaces. Okay, what is step one? What is the first thing you encounter? Um, money's a mystery. I covered that a couple sessions ago. Um, markets are real. Um, uh, death is final. Um, you can upload your mind into these things. We can mitigate death, as we saw in the movie. The movie, The Future of Work and Death, um, there is a relationship between work and death. There's kind of a death in life. Would UBI lead us to greater freedom, meaning, identity, um, uh, agency? Uh, God only knows. Um, it doesn't look that way in terms of what is actually being prescribed for a population. But here's your first thing. Um, falling in love. Love is a mystery, like money, like death. Um, uh, you sense that you don't want to be a zombie and you want to feel it. You want to fall in love. So immediately, in terms of, of entering into uh, a moral, immoral, and amoral space with love, just let's just posit that. I create spaces. I design them. I build them. I project them. I do it for the arts. I do it for commerce. I do it for health studies. I've done it for the police. Um, all of these things are interesting in this first thing, which is called the um, prisoner's dilemma. Um, two people form a society, maybe one of love, maybe one of a task. Um, there's some other entity trying to break up this society. Well, let's just call it a police. <coughs> That's why it's called a prisoner's dilemma. You're put in separate cells and asked to think on each other, to, to betray each other. Um, one does, one doesn't. The other does, the other doesn't. Um, it leads to a matrix of payoffs that are less unless both of you decide implicitly without information from either one not to betray the society you created. Now, one of the most interesting, dynamic, empathetic, um, moral states you can enter into is one of love. It's not always given. It could turn to bean counting, could turn to externalization. We have great debates about um, the nature of modern love. Um, we have many, many spilt a lot of ink, had a lot of crooner songs uh, devoted online to the basic neurotics of love. As Freud pointed out, is um, the disruptive thing, the greatest way to, to enact a profit from an individual is to resell them something that is essentially free to them in the beginning. And that's done by disruptive, neurotic sort of techniques. Okay, um, love of your parents, love of someone else, uh, puppy love. Uh, going into a society, we see the matrix here, entering it into. And this is, uh, this is to um, simulate an amoral space, uh, the online dating spaces, the... Um, the social media, DMing someone, all of this stuff. So here it is. We have partner says, I love you. You say, I love you. It leads to romantic bliss. That's the optimal position of, of the, um, of the romantic love. 
Um, second one, partner stays silent. You say I love you. You feel rejected. Yeah, kind of. Um, partner says I love you. You stay silent. Partner feels rejected. This is this is um, one of the interesting aspects of moral, immoral, and amoral is time is a river. It keeps flowing. Um, people want to look at frozen time. You can in VR. This is the point of simulation and creating these amoral spaces to do so. But um, we keep on keeping on. Here's the other thing, which is kind of part of the zombie world we live in. Your partner stays silent. You stay silent about love. You're seeing each other. You're having everything you want about love. Uh, sunsets, um, beautiful nights, uh, long walks on the beach. But you stay silent. Uh, she stays silent. Um, uh, you keep your dignity intact, um, so you think. That love, which a lot of ink's been spilled about, uh, Eric Fromm, The Art of Loving, uh, Freud, all of the, you know, the people with cynical views on it, the people with uh, Esther Perel, uh, Dan Savage, all these people devising uh, the, the amazing book called The Ethical Slut, all these people devising these works on um, on what you should do to, to fill out your life, to make your life complete. Um, most of us as rational, sort of poised individuals might aim for dignity intact as opposed to romantic bliss because we think nothing ever lasts. This is a simulation anyway. They might not be in their right minds. <coughs> so this is the fundamental core. Whether you're a student in love, a cop in love, a doctor in love, these, and we assume these, the more you're able, capable to love, the more we want to hang around you because you're capable of taking risks and empathizing with the other, other parts of humanity, whoever you decide to love. So this is the fundamental position of the prisoner's dilemma. Now there's, I sent you in the link, there's some interesting, and this has everything to do with drama. Uh, where do we begin? Where do we, if drama is an amoral space, which we're just sitting out here watching, where do we begin? Um, how can we evaluate whether it's completed this task of starting as amoral and entering into um, immorality, where we decide that Claudius, the king, is immoral because he poisoned, dropped poison in the ear of his brother in order to take over the kingdom and to marry Gertrude. Uh, Hamlet accuses his mother Gertrude of being uh, amoral at best, immoral if she knew and is trying to, to, to figure out where she really stands on this. She dies. Spoiler alert. He dies too. Hamlet does. You've seen it. You should have seen it. You can see it many times throughout this. And um, the next one is um, uh, uh, this fundamental nuclei, this core. So Polsky, I put in your link, um, says that uh, we see these examples. We see vampire bats in the cave. The mother vampire bat flies home and is filled with blood from sucking it all night long and feeds her children and feeds the children the infant bats next to it just to redistribute the wealth. Uh, there are cases if she doesn't or appears that she's engorged and she doesn't do this, this tit-for-tat mentality takes over amongst the close vampire bats and she's chilled out. Um, the, um, he says that in deference to this t temporal aspect, um, that this tit-for-tat aspect takes over in all our lives, fundamental core motivation on moral spaces, a position we want to defer to, not the zombie world of the amoral space. 
Um, but through time, this becomes the iterated tit for tat or forgiving tit for tat. We, um, the bat, um, uh, forgives the returning female bat who only feeds her children and um, uh, uh, allows a forgiveness in terms of signal, uh, signal difference, signal. Uh, she's missing out on the signals, the moral signals from the rest of the vampire bat. So um, his view in biology, seen at a, a simple uh, multi-celled creatures on up to human beings, that this resonance in the biological world is this um, forgiving tit for tat. Here's the foundation of it. Who, what state of romantic bliss do we want to be in, real one? We want, as Campbell said, we want to feel truly alive and not just endlessly search for meaning, maximizing meaning. Um, or do we want to keep ourself intact? Um, very important. We've, at the times of love, probably much like the vampire bat feeding their own children, we want, we recognize this, these epochs to be very tenuous. As Periclean Greece, Elizabethan England, Weimar Germany, were perilously um, uh, unstable and did tip over into to non-desirable uh, states. Um, the Athenians lost the Peloponnesian War. The Elizabethans went into decadent Jacobean England and then toward a restoration, toward a civil war with Cromwell, devastated the society. And of course, we know what happened to Germany in the 30s and 40s, um, as a reflection of, of what Brecht said we should, um, we should attend to. Uh, going onward, um, the individual lived, we have a memory, family, we have representation, uh, mythology about that um, uh, uh, individual. The collective and the lived is history. Um, so we have photos of our family and we po post them on Facebook and then for our history we go to things such as Ellis Island and try and figure out if our family name was changed at the island and Anglif anglicized or whatever happened to our name, whether we came from the Pale or Italy or Sicily or Norway or whatever. Um, but the collective and the representative is archetypal. So how do we create simulated space archetypally? Um, there's the archetypal cop um, uh, abusing their position, uh, 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 using it with cruelty, um, having a grudge, all of that, <coughs> instead of the thin blue line between anarchy and order. Um, we have their archetypal um, uh, uh, slacker student found in Hamlet who returns back to his kingdom. He should practically inherit, take it on, maybe marry Ophelia. He's already had sex with her, so it's, it's a question of her uh, medieval virginity against society, perhaps a reason why she goes nuts in addition to having her boyfriend kill her father. Um, uh, but we see a slacker student who wishes to remain an amoral fly on the wall and everything around him starts pointing toward uh, demanding a sense of agency. Um, we have those archetypes. Um, the archetypes of Berlin, uh, Weimar, Germany in the 20s is a very permissive um, liberal sort of society, great series was Babylon Berlin, which treated these elements as chess pieces to show that it was there. In terms of my projects, doing and making and creating, doing the, the Earl Lear thing with Rick, we see Earl as an amoral figure, as a working class Quebecois growing up in uh, Massachusetts, uh, being outside of the archetypal aspect of his society, but having to enter back into it. 
um, we see those dichotomies. Um, the archetype is a realm of the cliché. It is the realm of strongly etched characters. It's the, the too seen too much in these Marvel, DC, superhero, Hollywood films where just a return back to um, back to these almost medieval morality tales um, that we see. One could say the same thing about um, Casablanca, which was designed, built, written out of the studio system of Hollywood, um, uh, not broadly designed characters. The characters are archetypal. Rick is the archetypal American amoralist. Um, I'm out of it. I'm isolated. I'm just here trying to make money. Don't give me this BS about fascism taking over Europe. It has nothing to do with me. I live in Casablanca. Uh, his love affair with Ingmar Bergman, uh, Elsa, I forget the character, um, saying, oh, wow, that, that sort of gnaws on him, saying, oh, wow, at one point in my life I did feel alive when I lived with her, I, I was had a romantic thing with her, but she had a, a husband who was taken by the Nazis. And, and so you also have the, the not figures, archetypal Nazis. There's our way or the highway. If you weren't born into our way, you're going to hit the highway. Um, so that reaches down into Casablanca. Then we have Claude Rains playing the, the French Vichy official definitely amoral uh, all the way just the the pleasant uh, uh, Franco uh, 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 bon vivant um, who says well let's let's turn it back on these unpleasantries the, the typical benign bureaucrat who also has to take a, a position so Rick's this is a highly cliche film dealing with archetypes moving from individual to representative mythologies, collective into archetypes, setting up, trying, uh, I think it was done in the 30s before the World War II, trying to push the American sensibility toward one way. Americans did want to accept a, a position of neutrality. Certainly by this time, uh, many of the Jewish community in America knew that people were being rounded up. Um, this was a film dealing with archetypes to strongly push people one way or the other in terms of their allegiances, to get out of the amoral zone, enter into the moral zone. This is a great Mencken quote, science must be amoral by its very nature. The minute it begins separating facts into the two categories, the good ones, good facts, and bad facts, it ceases to be science and becomes a mere nuisance like theology. This is part of our problem at these huge STEM tier one research universities. Um, <clears throat> maybe you're a science student pursuing the amoral, um, as Mencken would say. Uh, maybe you have your own belief system set up, little lines drawn in your brain. Um, and that's fine. You're living your life. You're doing whatever you want to do. Um, you're bean counting in the world of science. Uh, as Mencken said, it's an amor or amoral world. Um, the facts themselves are not good facts or bad facts, um, but they are. Um, uh, they have to be amoral in order not to be a nuisance, as he says, like theology. Um, Simulation, sim, uh, simulacrum, as Baudrillard would point out. Um, so here are your possibilities. There's not only the prisoner's dilemma. Uh, I love you, I love you. Um, really? Um, well, I don't. Um, that's a disharmonic area. Uh, the prisoner's dilemma begs toward a defection. It implies a third entity, cops, authority, fascists, whatever, impinging on the two uh, partners, lovers, people who devised simple societies. 
the idea of harmony as in the vampire bats flying off to feed each other. Again, this is everything to do with design, everything to do with drama. Um, we make simulated spaces. Ugh, that is it. Um, in order to hopefully live better, the, the morality of living better. Um, uh, Snowdrift is an interesting, very interesting, because prison, Prisoner's Dilemma has opacity. You don't know what your lover, partner, person you made a society with is going to say to the cops, to the prison guard. Um, whereas in the snowdrift, you do. The paradigm, the trope, is two cars come up to a snowdrift from different areas. They cannot pass. This might be a marriage. This might be child rearing. This might be um, a business partnership. Um, and you look at each other from the windshield and go like, hey, are you, are you going to get out and shovel this? And the other one goes like, no, I thought you would get out and shovel this. Um, this is a very real uh, position in this question of simulating spaces. A lot of the palliative, curative, and um, uh, no, preventive, curative, palliative aspects of medicine involves a snowdrift game, involves this idea of transparency. We know the facts. You got cancer. You might not have a lot to time to live. Why don't you beef up, fatten up, and buy yourself a little more time. Um, the two people stop in front of Snowdrift. Snowdrift needs to be cleared in order for them to have progress and go on their way. They could cooperate by both getting out of the car, but then they would both be in a discomfort. Um, if you have a child, get married, have a child, not get married, have a child, you and your partner are cohabitating and your child is crying at a very young age, and the, uh, you, husband, wife, gay, straight, whatever, turn to the other one, well, hey, why don't you, hey, it's your turn to take, take care of the kid, feed the kid at night. Um, that's the pure, purest example of snowdrift game is, is this um, transparent duty and transparent idea of taking care. This is um, uh, things that, the vampire bats um, leads to the um, uh, iterated quid pro quo uh, tit for tat um, structure that Sapolsky talks about. Um, uh, the mother next to him said, oh wow, you really scored tonight. Um, from each according to their means to each according to their needs. And the other vampire mother says, no way, dude. Um, uh, my kid gets all the blood. Very graphic and savory uh, examples of that. Um, so we enter into that. The stag hunt is an interesting aspect I've encountered in the business world. I've encountered in my teaching. We are making a society here with asynchronous means, um, strangely. You, the students, me, the professor. I tend to my research. I do all of that with a with a seriousness, as I think all academics should, in order not to turn the university into an obsolete monastery, factory, warehouse, mostly warehouse, um, is the stag hunt. Um, it takes a society to attempt bigger goals, put a, a man on the moon, uh, cure cancer, all of these, these things. Um, uh, yeah, one could use that example of Madoff or that young uh, Stanford University dropout. I forget her name now. She uh, ascribed to, she started her own, with venture capital, her own uh, biological uh, engineering firm and basically was built on, on falsities. Okay, you're, you're out hunting a big deer, the stag. The stag is so big it'll feed the whole tribe. You're with, let's just say cliche, you're with a bunch of other hunters or probably men um, out there uh, hunting. Uh, and um, 
one of your members, you're stealthily stalking this prey, you gotta be upwind of it, um, you can't tip it off, you can't step on a twig, you can't disturb the very elaborate um, stag hunt that you've always done, you know what works, but it might not work this time. And one of your members uh, sees a little bunny, um, says, oh, sh shoot, this is small, it'll make me a meal, not the other person that's right here screw this plan I'm gonna I'm gonna grab the bunny and eat it so he grabs the bunny eats it disrupts the whole the stag hears the noise runs off the rest of the group is angry uh, by stability is the nature of this in an amoral space we can do this well uh, we can create a simulated space um, with um, the um, simulated space with VR and say what do you want now we can always act as if all of this matters as if we're a mother vampire bat returning with blood to feed all the young ones around us because we're successful um, but what if they don't care what if they don't <coughs> they're ungrateful um, and so forth um, uh, again I keep mentioning this this is my research direction to see if we can create these moral spaces out of simulated space from my background in architecture urbanism theater theater design narratives narrative design ai technology what uh, the 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 gadgets change from year to year but the theories don't strangely um they really don't um, this fundamental uh, kernel position of of uh, uh, the game structure. And these are games. The Jane McGonigal wrote that book, um, Life is Gaming or Gamification or whatever. I just, I found it, I wanted to like it. I found it kind of shallow and nerdy. Um, uh, she contends that if we have a problem, why not gamify it like the female vampire bat? Um, create these simulated spaces all society could work on discovering cancer if it's game there was um there's a kind of a game they took from protein folding called fold it uh where you in an online resource you folded certain proteins to make you know protein as the building blocks of organic world um uh and they determined this 15, 16 year old boy was folding proteins in a manner that surpassed a lot of research universities that this, there's a whole big utopic thing, Clay Shirky was on this, about, um, about the wisdom of crowds. James Sarecki, uh, Chris Anderson, um, all talking about the wisdom of crowds, the crowds who could determine how much the the prize cow weighed at the county fair because they interpolated um, the bell curve of different submissions on weight. All that stuff that had been somewhat disproven by our good old friend, the black swan, coming out of nowhere and changing everything. Um, here is um, something fun. Uh, design alienation, design for alienation. Here's a little graph. Um, interesting. Um, one of the major things that interests me about drama is real life. Um, is a type of forecasting to problems I had I do have, and I will have. Um, I find a richness in the narrative structure of providing me not with a guidebook, but a reflection book on what happened. This is an interesting little graph, and I and I again the map is not the territory, and this is a lot of graphs, and I'm trying to break it down into this moral, immoral, amoral uh, realm something which went back when I was an undergrad pre-architecture studying philosophy history as majors 
working on my craft in addition to working on some of these essential features which people have proven, disproven, do these things continue? Is Plato still viable after A.J. Eyre? Um, these are great questions that you used to go into an East Village bar and sit next to a stranger, cute or not, and talk about these bigger themes of is there such a thing as amorality. This is um, a graft of um, moral distress over time. Um, big moral distress, COVID, COVID-19. Big moral distress. What do we do? How are we doing? Who's, who's masking? Who's not masking? Who's vaccinating? Who's not vaccinating? What kind of validated scientific opinions? And we remember from Mencken, the best science can actually be is amoral uh, and don't push it into the, 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 the bad facts or good facts. They're just facts. Um, often, unfortunately, in today, because of the internet, people just go find the facts that validate their a priori positions. Um, we are designing spaces. You design the spaces. How do we design a space? Here's an interesting, uh, why do I keep adding philosophy to the mix? Because it needs to be there. If you're the mom of Vampire Bat coming back and you only want to feed your child, you have all the reasons in the world to. Is that immoral? Um, if you're baby vampire bat is starving and you don't want to feed the vampire bats around you. Um, in vampire society, vampire bat society, again, very vivid uh, trope uh, example here. Um, uh, uh, that's immoral. Uh, uh, perhaps it's amoral. The thing is we keep getting pushed from amoral positions back into into morality. We have to decide. We have to satisfy. So we can't keep maximizing our facts, uh, our basic amoral facts of science. Here is what happens in this, and I promise I will not um, dwell on these um, graphs because graphs are just paltry little indicators after all. Uh, moral distress. What's moral distress? The Me Too thing. Uh, uh, powerful men using their position with the so-called casting couch to exploit women, actresses, causing uh, unwanted sexual advances, things like that. Uh, it created a moral distress pervasively. Media fueled it. Um, uh, there were huge marches. This was... Uh, ignited by the election of Trump and certain statements he made, um, right, wrong, timely, non-timely, it created a moral distress. Uh, moral, uh, created this moral residue after that. Um, and then we see this little graph, the moral residue crescendos. Um, I saw a documentary on Epstein who ran the, the controversial... Um, brothel in the Bahamas and it was about the time of there was no way they could get him they tried to get him before and it just petered out he, um, somehow he slipped away or just a spank on the hand about what he was doing it was actually during the moral distress of Me Too that Little did he know, contextually, in this moral residue, he should not have returned back to the United States. Um, as soon as he landed, he was arrested. That was it. And whatever you believe out of this, um, again, a kind of subject of a Greek drama, uh, could be great dramatization about this story. Um, clearly with his... Um, his girlfriend too. Uh, uh, he was taken into custody because of the moral residue created from the Me Too movement. Um, and this created these spikes in it and uh, I contend that he was part of a larger conspiracy so he mysteriously uh, hung himself in his cell. But the point here is the moral residue. If going back 
if you are in your life um, a dutiful student getting a good GPA, but you're also a good mama vampire bat who comes back to feed your family to say, mom, dad, I'm going to become a doctor financier so I can take care of you when you get older. Saying it and then demonstrating you do it, does that would a moral, morally distressive thing such as, and we had a lot of this, we had a lot of grandparents living with people in these houses and the children not wanting to infect the grandparent, but we also had the moral distress of people just wondering what the function of education was, why do they have to go, why not see it on Zoom. Had a lot of students, not my own, um, post just you have your own stories, post pictures on the Zoom sessions as young people getting an education, as me as the mama vampire flying back to give you all the nourishment that you need in uh, education, some of you doubting this is actually an education. Um, all is fine, um, but there was no more biz as usual because of this moral residue. Uh, a lot of students would show up in their pajamas eating their Count Chocula on bed while giving. A lot of people just checked out altogether. Um, deeply questioned the the notion of the vampire bat cave, the, the whole purpose of the system, what is vaxxing, what is not vaxxing, what is uh, tragic tales of grandmas dying. Uh, I've known two or three people to have to have uh, died of these, um, this disease, um, this virus, and so forth. But let's go to, um, we're kind of wrapping up here um, with these graphs. I didn't want to deal with graphs, but it, it gives you an idea of drama. Gives you also an idea of expanded notion of narrative spaces. Gives you also an expanded idea of... Um, what can we learn from it? Um, what pleasures do we have in it? Knowing or seeing. What pleasures did a Greek woman or slave have sitting all the way back up into one of these 20, 30,000 seat theaters having, I think, you were forced to go seeing Oedipus tear out his eyes after realizing he had killed his father, married his mother, had four children by her, set into motion the whole thing with Antigone, Ismene, uh, Telem uh, not Telemnicus, that's Ulysses' sons, uh, Eteocles, Polynices. Um, what she thought, what um, one of the groundlings, the people standing up in the middle of the circle, you know, exposed to bad smells and, and food and all this other stuff, watching Hamlet, what they felt. Uh, Berliner Ensemble, the old one. I've been to the newer one <coughs> before the wall came down across Checkpoint Charlie in East Germany, um, watching Three Penny Opera, thinking about what choices uh, Polly had, what choices Maki Mesa had, uh, what what does it mean to play music? Is this a musical or is this, uh, you know, uh, bastardizing, um, uh, to, 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 I forget the Brecht drama, but they basically did guys and dolls from it to romanticize the whole thing about urban living uh, where Brecht was providing us with a laboratory. So we go on to the... Um, May you live in interesting times thing. Um, this is it. Um, let me pump it up a little bit. Uh, zoom in. Okay. View, zoom in. Yeah, that much. Um, you are here, you're 2000. Um, this is a whole thing on numbers. Moral residue. Vampire bat caves. Prisoner's Dilemma, Snowdrift Game, Loving Someone Else, uh, Becoming a Cop, Becoming a Doctor, Becoming a Student, uh, 
as Douglas Rushkoff said, living in the tyrannical now. With the internet, we're always in the now. Must be like what a country bumpkin coming to the big city of Ur uh, must have felt entering these vast cities and connected cities, and connectivity was a large part of it, in the Euphrates going like, oh, wow, I've really arrived, haven't I? Um, the now. Uh, we're here the now on the downhill side of <coughs> post-peak oil. As Rushkoff and many other people have said, what we do know beyond the black swan, beyond being the rebellious mama vampire bat, beyond the, the iterated tit-for-tat, beyond being in the consummate love position where our love will transcend the world outside of it, uh, uh, what's going to happen? Um, uh, we know we've had this dependency on oil. It's given us cheap food on an industrial scale. It's given us industrial war. It's given us industrial markets around the world that become post-industrial markets because now they're connect up. NFTs are kind of a simulacrum. Uh, cryptocurrency, as all currencies, are a types of simulacrum like love. They're a mystery. Money's a mystery. Is it useful or is it exchangeful? What if I live in the realm of exchange and just go off and buy my yacht or even buy my BMW before I'm 29? Um, buy my house. Um, these are things that attack the unscrupulous. Um, this is kind of a, a assembled by the responsible architects talking about what is the, oh, the Faustian. We live in, according to Spengler, we've left the Magian era. And the Renaissance person enters the Faustian era in the West. Um, we do, we think, we feel, we prognosticate as if there's no hell to pay. We are the mother vampire bat returning back to the cave and only feeding our kids as if there is no hell to pay. As if the other mother vampire bats won't beat you up or do whatever. Um, we can sit in our car in the snowdrift game and demand that a man or a woman or whatever identity of the person next in the next car said, you're dot dot dot, you're a man, why don't you get out and shovel the snow? Um, as if there's no hell to pay. Uh, this is the, the aspect of the tyrannical now. In Rushkoff's idea, uh, uh, there's the old book, Future Shock, written by Elvin Toffler, read it, talking about what we're encountering in the future and how we can backcast to alleviate these things. There's, he did a, a second, actually, greater book of talking about what people how people would be working from their cottages electronic cottages of the future uh, he wrote that with his wife it was pretty good then doug rushkoff wrote uh, present shock that were continually shocked by um the present um making more residues disruptions so forth meanwhile this thing about the um post peak oil was just tipping a tipping point always happening. Naomi Klein talks about it in shock doctrine. Certainly every day under Trump, there was a, a destabilizing shock value to the news or some outlandish thing our leaders said representing us. Um, remember that quote by German in Germany during the 30s. I forget who it was who said uh, people deserve... People fully deserve the government they get. Um, this is a society uh, 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 trying to live in the zombie-like amoral, um, getting the governments they deserve. So what does um, moral shock have to do with this? What is, what is the tipping points and the black swans flying in out of nowhere, such as COVID-19? Um, what do we have to do to make these um, spaces? I'm asking you guys to think about social VR, brand new, off the shelf, anyone can do it. Everyone's got a cell phone. There was a time 
Earl about 15 years ago that I was stopped for doing certain projects because the upper older administration and older faculty thought students needed uh, these public machines in order to do this because they didn't have these economically the resources when nowadays everyone has a $1,200 phone in their pocket. Um, uh, sort of an inability to look at the facts around it. So this, the red line are all of these um, imagine scenario, imagine estimated population, estimated to top out at 11 billion. We're almost at eight now. With human die off, it's down to five. Food um, conjoined oil will drop the little green line and natural resources will drop drastically, including especially uh, nickel cadmium in the batteries. We think that these things such as CRISPR and fusion and new things uh, such as that will get us, technology will be a panacea when we do not look at all the numbers flowing into these decisions. Um, this is it for now. Um, a lot of graphs, but at the kernel, the, the kernel dramatic research ethical positions that people enter into why drama is fun, why intimacy is fun, why taking risks is also fun regardless of the, of the results, why agency is fun. Um, this leads to all of these discussions. I hope you mull it about um, after a lot of how to, how to do SketchUp, how to do um, social VR, we're entering into this final phase with the class. Um, see you then, and um, get back to it. Ciao.